All right, welcome back. Okay, hopefully the uh, last um, session was a good one for you. We, uh, for those of you that are just joining us, we talked about um, Windows Phone platform development, um, like how to build applications and games for Windows Phone. It was a bit of a whirlwind tour. Uh, hopefully, uh, it gave you some ideas as to what you can do. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit now, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, HTML5, and not in the sense of how you build phone apps with HTML5, but really a primer on what HTML5 is all about. Um, so the reason for that is before we learn to run, we have to learn to walk. And we're going to learn how to walk by uh, showing you some really cool demos that uh, will allow you to sort of get a feel for what HTML5 really is and why, why, the, why people are talking about it and being so, uh, why it's so powerful for everybody. Um, so with that, before I continue, those of you that are just joining me and don't know who I am, uh, my name is Paula Berge. I am a technical evangelist with Microsoft Canada. Um, so basically, Windows Phone, Windows Azure, Windows 8, HTML5, all those types of things are things that I talk about uh, to developers such as yourselves, uh, as well as all my colleagues, such as Jonathan Rosenblatt, who uh, was, is the host of this thing. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me on Twitter or email. It's right there. Uh, and without further ado, let's continue and let's have a lot of fun with this. This is a lot of fun, this, uh, this topic. So, all right. HTML5, what is it? Well, it's a really tough question to answer. And those of you that are in the IM window saying it's the one after HTML4, you should be banished because although it's technically true, it's really not the answer I'm looking for. So if you think about it, these are some of the things that I think are HTML5. One, it's the future of the web. So when we talk about the web being this, uh, you know, browser-based type of environment and you know the ability to you know create web pages that are cool and things like that i'll tell you right now the web is changing in ways that has never seen before and we're seeing it because the html specification as it is evolving is actually growing to the point where you're able to create these immersive experiences that don't look like traditional web pages and that's great for the browser but not only that we're also seeing platforms take advantage of HTML5 in ways that allow them to, developers such as like web developers to make use of those skill sets to build native uh, um, um, experiences using HTML5. Windows 8 is a great example. You can build a native application, not a web control within a native wrapper, but a native application in Windows 8 using HTML5 techniques. WebOS uh, was actually a fantastic example of that as well. Unfortunately, WebOS has sort of gone by the wayside a bit, I believe LG bought them, but uh, it was a really great example of what you can do with, with HTML technologies in, in creating a great platform associated with it. So it's not just about the web anymore. It's actually about you know seeing how we change the way we implement app experiences and web pages and everything else like that. And it's not just about native apps, not just about the web, it's about services. It's about how you host these things and say, for example, in Azure and things like that. The whole point, is that it's not just a marketing message. Yes, there's a lot of hype around HTML5, and you probably heard a lot of it already. You know, standards-based browsing and all those types of things. It's important, absolutely important, but it's beyond that. It's actually a sea change in how we're actually developing applications in the modern era of IT, and uh, therefore creating a great experience. It's also not complete yet. So those of you that weren't aware, uh, HTML5 is, well, we're going to talk about what HTML5 actually is, but the, the way people think of HTML5, it's actually a set of standards that are not yet even ratified by the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C, uh, as it's known. There is an expectation that these working documents, as they're called, the standards that are in progress uh, of being drafted, uh, will be ratified by 2014 timeframe. So we still have a long way to go. Um, that means that HTML5 is a bit of a moving target. And what I mean by that is that you have browsers such as IE10, and we'll show you some great examples of how IE10 is changing the way people view Internet Explorer. But not just that, like IE10, Chrome, Firefox uh, from Mozilla, and uh, you know Opera as well as Safari. All these browsers claim to be HTML5 compliant, and that term is actually a little bit of a moving target right now because the fact that the, ma uh, the matter is these standards are not ratified yet, which means that there's interpretation. So browsers can interpret the way they think the standards will look like 
and implement and render experiences on that specific browser associated with that, which means that there could be differences between how IE manages or renders an experience compared to Chrome, Google Chrome, for example. It's also very large, and I'll get to that in the next slide. It's a fantastically large sort of set of specifications, which means that being HTML5 compliant on your website or your application is not a yes or no. Right? There's a lot of in-between, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Finally, HTML5 has to be done the right way. And this is a really, really important uh, thing to keep in mind. So those of you that were familiar with how Flash came onto the scene uh, from Macromedia before uh, Adobe, Flash was this great new technology, a plug-in technology for browsers that allowed you to create experiences on the web that frankly just did not seem like a web experience because you were able to do all these interesting things with the visuals, with the animations and things like that. It didn't look like your traditional you know, input text, buttons, radio buttons, check boxes, drop lists, all those types of things that you typically saw on an HTML page. With great power comes great responsibility. And unfortunately, we ended up with a lot of situations where people saw Flash as a way to create these wild and crazy sort of experiences that cr frankly were really horrible they became known as flash catastrophes. And there is an, actually it's kind of interesting, a couple of days ago I read an article in, on, uh, on the web about how HTML5 is becoming the new flash catastrophe because you can do so much with HTML5, and I'll show you some great demos of what you can do, that people are actually abusing the power that HTML5 has. Just because you can build something doesn't mean you should. And I think that's one of the things that you should keep in mind when you're actually building these experiences. Um, Standard design, good design will always trump uh, any sort of bells and whistles that you need. So keep that in mind when you're actually building your experiences, whether they're native applications or whether they're web applications. So what is HTML5? Well, it starts off with, uh, working, uh, with the standards uh, um, groups. So the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, so you can go to their website at w3c.org, and ECMA which unfortunately ECMA, the name actually, the acronym, the actual name for the acronym escapes me, but basically these are the guys that created ECMAScript, and I'll explain what ECMAScript is in a second. These are the governing bodies, okay? The, the, the people that basically at an organizational level say, these are the standards. And so, for example, W3C mandates, you know, how the HTML4 specification and before that is going. They also govern how the process by which the HTML5 specification will be actually defined, and that's really important. Beneath that are what's called the working groups. So we have an HTML, uh, HTML working group, CSS, which stands for Cascading Style Sheets, Web Apps, SVG, which is for vector graphics, geolocation, which may be kind of tough to see there, as well as ECMAScript. Now, ECMAScript is interesting as well. Um, ECMAScript is more commonly known as JavaScript, and the reason why it's not called ECMAScript today and more known, more known as JavaScript was ECMAScript was a scripting language very similar to a C or a Java type of uh, language if you think about it from a syntax standpoint. And it was brought out around the same time, slightly before, say, for example, Java came out uh, back in the, the mid-90s, I guess you could say. Now, Netscape, uh, when they brought out Navigator, their, uh, their, their browser, they saw navigate, they saw the ability for JavaScript to be an interesting way to create some dynamics on the client side for uh, web, web, web applications like HTML so that you can have some, some interesting um, uh, interactivity using programmatic techniques using ECMAScript. But they said ECMAScript doesn't sound very cool, so we're going to call it JavaScript. And you know, even though it has nothing to do with Java and it has no sort of um, you know, virtual machine associated with it or a Java virtual machine, it, they just wanted to hook on to the, the, the wave that was Java. So they called it JavaScript, even though it had nothing to do with it. And the rest, as they say, is history. Now JavaScript is prevalent everywhere, uh, for better or for worse in a lot of ways, because there's a lot of good and a lot of bad associated with JavaScript. So there's just some ideas around what ECMAScript really is. But these are basically the working bodies, the blue, the blue area that you see right there. And the working bodies are, are governed by a number of different companies. So for example, Microsoft. Um, Google, Apple, Mozilla, Opera, uh, all these types of folks as well as um, uh, you know, educational facilities and leading thinkers on, uh, on the web, they're all part of these working groups sort of governing bodies, the, uh, the, ch the, the board members I guess you could say for each of these set of uh, working groups. 
and they are the ones that basically provide recommendations to the World Wide Web Consortium to say, this is what we think the standard should be, and this is how we should move forward. And the W3C basically says yes or no, and uh, it's usually as a result of you know, a lot of you know, compromise between all the various different uh, ideas and things like that. But so far, it's been working pretty well. And yes, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Mozilla, we all work just nicely together. And in fact, we don't have all the things that we agree upon, but certainly uh, in the best interest of having the right answer for HTML5, this is something absolutely that we're working together hand in hand with these folks. And below them are the actual standards. And as you can see, there's quite a few, right? When people say HTML5, they're usually talking about all these standards, even though if you take a look, HTML itself is actually only like a set of like 10 of these standards out of the 50 or 70. It's, there's a lot to it that's beyond just HTML. And in fact, you know, CSS and web apps are, are the largest amount of information that are associated or the standards that need to be ratified. And we'll show you where we're at uh, today uh, a little bit later at the end of this, uh, this session. But really, this is what HTML5 is all about. So I'm going to show you a few examples of uh, web standards in action. So I'm actually going to go to IE10. Okay. So IE10 is what comes by default with, uh, with Windows 8, and it's now available on Windows 7 as well. In addition to that, uh, IE10 is what you find on Windows Phone 8. So the engine is shared across both. So if, if you have an experience on Windows 8, and you want to bring it to Windows Phone 8 from the web that, that is rendered in IE10, chances are they'll render pretty close together, if not the same, uh, between the two platforms. So that's something that's really, really interesting. And the great thing about IE10 is that, by far, this is the most standards compliant browser that Microsoft has ever built. And in fact, it's among the, the most standard compliant browsers ever. Um, so we're neck and neck with uh, all of our competition, obviously. but. The bottom line here is that we have a, a solution for standards-based browsing that I think is leaps and bounds beyond anything you've ever seen before. And to be honest, when I talk to competitive web developers that have never seen IE in years or hate IE because they have to do weird things to make it work properly with their web applications, they're pleasantly surprised and they love what they see because there's a lot of goodness that's associated with it. And it's fast. It's really fast too. So, I'm going to show you a few examples, and I'm actually at beautyoftheweb.com, and you can take a look at this site on any browser if you want. But basically, beautyoftheweb.com is Microsoft's site for determining and showing great experiences on HTML5. Okay, so the whole idea here is to have a great experience on HTML5 and show it on our browser, but certainly you can show it on Google Chrome if you want and anything else like that. So I'm actually going to go here to the Touch Gallery, even though I don't have a Touch device that I'm using this on. There's a lot of really interesting sort of examples. And as you can see here, there's a video that's playing and a few things. If I go here, there's Contre Jour. And Contre Jour is a, uh, is a game that was built by uh, a set of uh, Montreal developers, actually. It's a fantastic little, uh, little game. And it's available on Windows Phone as a native application, but they've actually brought it to Windows uh, to HTML5 as well. And you can actually go to Play Now and you can play the game. I'm not going to actually go to it, but you can take a look at it. There's some great stuff there. And you know it's not just games. There's graphics. This one's interesting. So Atari. Everybody's probably familiar with Pong and you know Space Invaders and Ga Galaga and uh, you know Tank, uh, the, the tank game that you see right there. I can't quite remember what it what it's called. Um, but regardless, these are all classic games. And basically, what we did was the IE team, the Internet Explorer team had a partnership or created a partnership with Atari to bring these games to the browser using a standards-based uh, experience using HTML5. So all the games that you might see here are actually HTML5 based. Now the good thing about this is that it was a Canadian developer by the name of Grant Skinner based out of Edmonton that actually built the JavaScript engines and things like that to make this happen. He's the one that actually implemented these games, these classic games onto HTML5 compliant experiences. Uh, he's an amazing guy, really nice guy, and uh, it's really great because if you go there, and I'm just going to go to this one very, very quickly. As you can see, it's just loading it up. There's all these different games here. So Missile Command, for example, we'll do Lunar Lander, Lunar Lander just to show you. Single player, start the game. So as you can see, it's just loading the game. Just wait for it to show up. 
And if I right click on this, it's not, there's no context or anything. It's literally all just uh, um, HTML5. So while this is loading up, you'll notice that, you know, that this is, looks like a pretty rich experience already. And here's the example here. Okay. I'm just going to let him sort of fall as you can see. He's going to die. But, but it's interesting because Grant created this create.js JavaScript library that you can get at dev.atariarcade.com that allows you to make your own games using the libraries that he's created. So as you can see here, yeah. Okay, so if you're interested in playing and in, in, in creating games in HTML5, you absolutely can do that. Now, there's one other thing. There's Pulse, which is a newsreader. I guess uh, we don't have any more here. There's one that I do want to tell you about, and that's uh, Cut the Rope. So Cut the Rope is a very popular game on iOS, and uh, it was actually uh, it was created by Zepto Labs, and Microsoft actually talked to Zepto Labs to see if they wanted to port it to HTML5, similar to what we did with our, uh, the Atari Arcade. And the interesting thing about this was they said, okay, sure, let's do it, and they built it. And the cool thing is, is they actually created a uh, case study, and we can provide the case study for this as and it's in video format as well as some some things. They how they actually went from iOS to HTML5, and then from there. Uh, if you remember correctly from what I talked about earlier, Windows 8 uh, provides a native, um, a native experience for, win uh, for HTML5. Uh, they actually ported that game using more than 80% of the assets that they created for the HTML5 game. They used that within their Windows 8 game. So very easy to port over to Windows 8. So just an example there are some really, really interesting things that are there. Now I am going to show you one more site here. And this is basically uh, the Internet Explorer test drive. So ietestdrive.com, which basically redirects to ie.microsoft.com slash test drive. And these are some demos that show some interesting, uh, you know, ways that you can actually create uh, some experiences on HTML5. So, for example, if I go to Fishbowl, it's going to show you the f how fast things are on, on, uh, on, on IE10. So, as you can see, I'm at 50, uh, 60 frames per second. I'm going to bring this up to, say, 2,000 fish. Wait for it. There you go. That's a lot of fish, but it's also bringing down the frame rate. But this is an HTML5 sort of uh, experience all the same. And the interesting thing here is that, you know, it's still very, very fast. As you can see, now that it's sort of rendering things, it's using GPU acceleration. So IE10, by default, uses a GPU graphics processor unit acceleration to actually speed up the JavaScript rendering, and that's true on the phone as well. So uh, regardless of whether you're using it on the PC, on Windows 8, or on Windows Phone 8, you get this goodness. And you can actually test uh, these sites like IE Test Drive on your phone. So even if you're in the emulator, you can test it out there. So that's something to think about. Okay. So I'm going to just exit this so that we don't get the go. Let's just get back to the to the to the presentation. So when we're talking about the HTML5 specification, it was a kind of a small component of the number of standards that are out there. But frankly, a lot of these standards uh, that are in the HTML5 standard are among the most important to actually creating these great experiences on uh, on on the browser as well as in native applications that might make use of HTML5. And among those, uh, the ones that I'm specifically going to talk about are Canvas and Video, and to an extent, Markup Elements. So I think what I'm going to show you is some demos around some of these things here. So if I go to Visual Studio, so I actually have a, a website, a locally hosted website here that sort of shows a few things. Now I want to show you, first of all, what an HTML4 document looks like. As you can see here, just let me minimize this so it makes it a little bit easier. This is a standard HTML4 like, document that is basically a minimized document. You have the doc type of type HTML, and then you have the DTD, which is described here in the, this URL, and namespace for the HTML, and then you have all this stuff. So this is sort of the minimum sort of standard that is HTML4 compliant. Now, if you take a look at, H, at HTML5, one of the things that the working group did was they actually minimized the amount of markup that's required to make things happen. So it's less verbose from a structural standpoint in the fact that, you know, all the stuff that might be considered extraneous, they've gotten rid of. 
Now, mind you, this is not a whole lot here, right? There's not a whole lot that this document can do, but it will actually, uh, if you put it through a HTML5 parser, this will pass, uh, which is kind of cool, right? So you, all you have to specify is a doc type being HTML, a title, and then tell the uh, browser which character set you're going to use. But that's not very interesting. And in fact, this is probably more to the case, right? So you have a doc type, title, meta char set, and then you have whatever you need inside the body as well. So let me show you some markup. And I'm going to actually bring this up in Internet Explorer first. So this app, uh, this uh, website, as I said, it's just local host here, but this could be anywhere, right? Uh, just some uh, dummy text here, but it's not really the text or the content specifically that's important. This is actually an HTML5 compliant document. It just looks like a regular web page, which is fine. It doesn't have to have all these bells and whistles to make it to make it uh, uh, HTML5 compliant. But there's a lot of interesting things in the markup, and let's take a look at what the markup looks like. So I'm just going to exit this. If we take a look at the markup itself. Okay, there's a whole bunch of uh, CSS, which we're just going to ignore for now. If I scroll all the way down, I'm going to show you some things that may be new to you if you're familiar with HTML but not HTML5. Still keep going. Okay, here we are. So you may notice here, okay, well, this is interesting. Nav, that's something that we haven't really seen before. And the reason why is because this, this is a navigational structure sort of syntax within the markup. Uh, that is used to sort of define what navigation is within your web page. The reason why this is important is HTML5 provides some semantics associated with it, meaning there's some context as to what the markup does. So what this means is that you can actually make use of you know, uh, markups such as nav to really better describe sections of your document. So in this case, the nav is just an unordered list but if you saw, it was actually a menu bar at the very top of the page that said about, you know, uh, all those types of things that you typically see on a menu bar on, on, on a web page. And it's CSS that's basically defining the look and feel for it. But that's really important because now you have an ability for you as a developer, for example, to just take a look at and say, oh, yeah, well, this is a navigational structure. I don't have to look for a div and find some weird, uh, you know, IDs and everything else like that to make that happen. Likewise, if you know being searchable on search engines is really important to your to you for your website, this also adds semantic context for the search spiders that actually said, okay, well, this is a navigational structure, so I'll spend time actually figuring out what the links are on this, so I have a better understanding of how to sort of traverse the site, and a whole bunch of other things. So that's something to keep in mind. Likewise, we have sections now, so this is different uh, than what you may have seen before, and you have articles. So again, this is all about bringing context and semantics to the, semantics to the actual, uh, actual document itself, which makes it more readable from a programmatic standpoint as well. Okay. All right. So that is basically it for the HTML5 demos, but I'm going to now show you some video demos. So video is one of the interesting things that's associated with, uh, with HTML5. Um, one of the things that uh, we used to have to do in the past is have like a Flash or a Silverlight plugin that actually did the, uh, the video streaming and things like that, which was fine, and it still works just fine today. But there's a, a movement going on that, you know, for uh, plugin-less uh, browsing. So you don't need to have uh, a, um, a dependency on a specific plugin to actually make use of you know, some rich content on the web. And the whole point behind video tagging on um, video tags in HTML5 is to really support that. So if you take a look here, this is literally all you need to actually run a video within an HTML5 enabled browser. So you have a video tag, which is a new tag, the source, and then you specify where the source is, and that's it. So if I actually play this in Internet Explorer, you'll see very quickly. Okay, nothing's going on. Well, let's find out. I'll right click on it and I, oh, there's play, mute, save video as, copy video, and then also the, play, uh, the playback speed. So I can press play and you'll see here now it's playing. So it didn't play automatically, so it just loaded the video and it's ready to go at that point. So that's all good, but let's take a look at this. That's not very interactive, right? So let's, let's take a look at a situation where we can actually get something a little bit more interactive. So let's go to Properties. Now let's take a look at the markup. 
So we have video tag, and there's a little bit more verbosity here, but it's actually good. So you can actually have a poster. So you can basically say that I want, when you first start the video uh, or load the video, I want it to have a specific image, you know, to be the thumbnail for it or whatever you want to call it. Autoplay. So you want it to autoplay, controls, loop equals true, preload, and there's some interesting things here, and I'll explain this in a second. But again, remember I was talking about the fact that one of the things that the HTML5 working group really wanted to do was limit the amount of verbosity that is associated with the structure or the skeleton stuff for HTML5. So if you'll notice here, we have autoplay and controls, but not autoplay equals true or controls equals true. In this case, we have loop equals true, but I could equally just say loop equal and just loop, and that's fine too. The whole point behind that is to make it more simple to just you know, code what you need to code and not have to worry about it. Now, you'll notice that the uh, video tag here ends right here, and then it's ending right here as well. But in between, we have sources. So the really important thing about this is the fact that if you have video, you're not guaranteed that you're going to have a specific type of codec that's supported, right? So MP4 is typically more often supported, H.264 video, those types of things. But say, for example, you had a situation where your browser didn't recognize this type of video. Well, it would just ignore that source and actually move to the second one. In this case, it's web, the WebM codec that Google provides. So you can actually support multiple different codecs and things like that within your video tag so that you always can make sure, do your best to make sure that you know, at any point the user can play your video. So if we play this, we'll see what this looks like. So you saw very quickly the poster that showed up. And we have autoplay equals true. So we have a situation where you are actually playing the video. And we have all these controls that are sort of showing. And I can press them and play. I can say, you know, maximum volume. I can bring that lower if I wanted to. I can make this full screen if I want to. This is all out of the box, just using a few tags or properties within your video tag. So that's kind of cool. All right. So let's look at the next one. Next one is full screen. So this is an interesting one. So again, we're just going to take a look at the video. In this case, we're just saying it's standard video tag, and we're saying it's autoplay. So there's nothing special in here. But what we're also saying is, oh, we'll take a look. We're adding an event listener in JavaScript. So the event listener is saying, OK, any time that you resize the window, I want you to make the video the maximum size possible for that window. And that's basically what this code is doing. So you can sort of see here, I'm getting the video into uh, a variable from, uh, from the video tag, setting the position to fixed, and then setting the, uh, you know, the video height and style and everything else like that, and the Z index to 100. So very, very simple. Now if we take a look at this, OK. Now I'm, OK, well, this I would have thought would have been full screen, right? Well, the reason why is because we added the event listener not on load to be full screen, but to be on resize. So if I go like this, ah, so I've actually moved it so that's actually very, uh, a very a different size window. It's actually brought it full screen there. So and then if I go full screen, or uh, maximize the window, it's still full screen, as you can see right there. Pretty simple. All right, so let's take a look at the next video example. This one we're going to talk about custom. So I'm actually going to show this one to you in the browser first before we actually show you the code because I think this makes sense. So we have a load video button. These are just standard HTML buttons, nothing special about them. But as you can see, you know, I've, I've added the capability to sort of manipulate the video via you know, standard HTML5 control or HTML controls. So I load the video. There we go. Then I can play it. And as you can see right here, we have a time going and all that type of stuff. I can pause it. I can play it. I can speed it up if I want to. I can mute it. Unmute it. Make it smaller if I want to as well. So it's actually very, very simple to do. Let's take a look at the code. So the, the um, OK, so what we have here are the input types equals button. So we have uh, the load video, the play. So these are standard HTML buttons, not HTML5 stuff. This is like HTML 1.0 stuff right here. And we're basically saying on click, we have an event handler for basically every time any of these buttons are uh, clicked. And then we have a div tag. But we don't actually have a video. So let's find out what's going on here. So if we have load video, so let's scroll up all the way to the top. So load video, basically what we're doing is we're, we're, we're getting uh, the element by ID, the progress and then basically the placeholder, okay? 
And then basically what we're doing is we're saying the player is we're going to create an element in JavaScript of type video into a type of player. And then basically we're saying that placeholder, which was this div tag at the very bottom, placeholder. So in the div tag, where are we here? Okay, in the div tag that we did, append an, a child uh, um, element within the, within the div of the type player, which is a video, and then say, here's the, uh, the source of the, uh, the video, and insert before the player, and then start playing. And there's all these things here. So again, you have the ability to manipulate the, Java, uh, the, the video via the JavaScript. And the, the video tag itself doesn't even exist in the HTML5 page. It's actually in the JavaScript that we're doing this. All right. So next one. This is where it gets kind of funny. So remember I was telling you about the fact that uh, we have a situation where you know not every browser is going to understand every single codec and everything else like that. I'm going to play this for you just so you can see this because this is where it gets kind of funny. So it's going to try to load the video or not. Let's see here. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I've added some alerts, and I'll show you the code to actually provide this. But basically, I'm saying the browser is asking first, do you support the video tag? I do. That's why it returns true. Okay, so that's fine. So it's going to ask the next question. Next question: Do you support MP4? And this is the answer that comes back from the browser. Maybe. Not true, not false. Actually, maybe. So that's kind of mysterious. And the reason for that is because of the fact that um, MP4 is you know, a file type, but it can be implement, implemented by a number of different codecs. So what we're doing here is saying, we're querying the browser saying, do you support MP4? And they're saying, maybe, because yeah, I do support certain codecs of MP4, but I may not support them all. So I might be able to play this file, but I might not be able to as well. I don't know. So that's fine. So we get a little bit more specific. Is the H.264 baseline uh, supported a little bit more? Uh, is, is it supported uh, as a codec for MP4? And it's basically saying here, probably. Not true, not false, not even maybe. It's saying probably. So it's making a guess. And the reason why it's saying that is saying, I can play that codec, but I don't know if I'm attached to a monitor, for example, or there might be a situation where the video cannot be played because of, you know, there's no sort of output or whatever it might be. So uh, basically, it's making an educated guess saying, yeah, you know what? I can play this, this, this baseline, but I don't know if you'll be able to see it because I don't know what I'm connected to. So that's basically what it's saying. And then as you can see here, now we're playing the, the actual video, and it's going, and it's doing its usual thing. All right. So let's take a look at the code. So here's basically what I'm doing. So I've got a video tag right here, OK? And I'm saying the source is MP4. And here's something that I didn't necessarily show you, but you know, the interesting thing is that just because it's uh, HTML5 video, it doesn't necessarily mean that you won't be able to make use of other things. So say, for example, you have the MP4 video of you know, H.264 baseline codec, but if for whatever reason your, your browser doesn't support that, it may actually go to an object. So it could actually play it in as a Silverlight object or a Flash object, however you decided to do it. So if I didn't have the ability to do HTML5 video, I could actually do this within you know, uh, within a Silverlight object if I wanted to. So let's take a look at the logic that I actually showed you for actually getting the, the answers back from the browser. So the first thing is when I load the window, add a listener of this type. You know, so I'm getting the video into a player type. And I'm saying, is video supported? Is the video tag supported? And remember how I said it was either true or false? That's basically this. So it's basically returning you know, player type dot can type, play type e not equal to null. So that will bring back a true or false. Likewise, the next question was, is MP4 supported? So then I'm going to say, can the player uh, on my browser play this mime type, so the video slash MP4? And it's going to say, maybe, again, because it doesn't know for sure if it can, because it knows it has some codecs, but not all of them. And then finally, is H.264 baseline supported? So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, can it play the type MP4? With these specific codecs, you know, AVC 4 da 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 da, da MP4A 40.2. So that's how you can get more and more specific. So it's showing you some of the logic behind how a browser actually plays and, and interprets whether it can play specific types of video. All right. Now we're going to show you some Canvas stuff. Okay. 
Canvas is really important to HTML5 because this is where the interactivity starts. The ability to have this uh, great sort of interactive uh, uh, capability with, with drawing things. And if you're building an HTML5 game, this is where the rubber meets the road in a lot of ways. That with the JavaScript and the CSS. So if we take a look here, here's a basic uh, canvas. So if I take a look here, we have a canvas tag, which is part of the HTML5 specification. And if you're on a browser that doesn't support tag, the canvas tag, it's just going to ignore the tag, and it's just going to say canvas not supported. But if it is supported, if canvas is supported by uh, the browser, basically what we're saying is that on the event listener, load the canvas into a, uh, into a variable, okay? And then basically saying, we're going to set the context of this variable, okay, into uh, into two-dimensional. So you have 2D or 3D capability within uh, uh, context. So if you're familiar with gaming, uh, the idea is you know you have a two-dimensional context for games like Angry Birds, and then for Halo, that would be sort of a three-dimensional context, and it has a whole lot more uh, complexity associated with, it, associated with it. So the whole point here is to actually determine what level of complexity your context will actually have within the canvas so that it can appropriately set up the canvas the right way. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to actually create a gradient, and I won't get into the specifics, but basically we're going to create a gradient and then fill the gradient into a rectangle of you know, 200 by 200 or whatever it is there, right? So if we take a look at this, it's actually going to be very, very simple to see what this does. There we go. So it's actually created the gradient. And if I right click on this, it's not an image, it's literally just a canvas element, and it's actually created the gradient using JavaScript and Canvas. So that's pretty cool. But there's more. Let's see what we can do. So if we take a look, um, drawing. Okay. In this case, I'm going to show this to you first because it's easier to show you this one. Okay. So we have right here we have a button which is an HTML5 button, and then we have an image which seems to be broken. But let's see what this is all about. But here is sort of empty. So if I go, oh, okay, well that's interesting. So I can make this interesting drawing right here, a squiggly, you know, ink blot test or whatever you want to call it. Press save, and all of a sudden there it is. Now if I right click on this, you'll see that, you know, I don't have an image here. This is literally a canvas. But if I right click here and go to properties, data, image, type PNG, base 64, and there's a whole bunch of data associated, associated with it. So right here, I've actually created an image on the fly of type PNG uh, just from this drawing right here. And if I change that, see it changes it right here as well. So let's take a look at the code very quickly. So down at the very bottom, we have a canvas, which was on the left-hand side. Then we put a button, standard HTML button. And uh, you know when you click it, you go to the save, uh, save method. And then you have an image of type image, but no source, because we're going to basically push the image from the canvas to that, uh, or the drawing from the canvas to that image as PNG. So let's take a look at the save. So if you take a look at the save function right here, we basically get the canvas from the query selector, and then get element by ID image source equals canvas dot to data URL. And that's literally it. That's all we have to do to actually create the, uh, the image from, from canvas. So that's pretty simple. Now also, from a drawing standpoint, when you load the, the actual page, basically at that point, the canvas is available for me to actually draw on. So again, I'm getting the canvas into a variable, setting the context to two-dimensional. And then there's a bunch of math here around uh, in an event listener for mouse moves. So every time the mo mouse moves, get the first point that it was there, and then the second point over a period of time. And then basically create a path, which basically is a line, and then draw that line. So basically what I'm doing is multiple times a, a second, or a, I'm basically getting the, uh, the points and then drawing a line between the two so that it actually creates a, creates a drawing that can be used. So that's very, very simple. And doing something like that in JavaScript alone would be very, very difficult to do, as you can imagine without using the canvas, that is. So that's great. Now I'm going to show you this one, the timer. So I'm going to show you this in the browser first so you can see it. You'll see two fish. There's a frame-based animation and a time-based animation. So the whole thing here is this is actually a canvas. So if I right-click on this, you know, there's no, no image or anything else like that. So the whole point here is that these fish are going at a separate sort of uh, speed. Obviously, the frame-based animation on the left seems to be going a little faster. 
Now, the reason why is because I'm basically, and I'll show you the code very quickly in a second, I'm saying that in frame-based animation, I'm trying to get as many frames in as possible. So every time I'm able to draw a frame on the, on the screen, I repaint the screen and put the image slightly lower than it was before, and that's really what I'm doing. Time-based animation, I'm saying every 60th of a second or every whatever, you know, half a second or whatever it might be, I'm saying repaint the screen and then put the image slightly lower. And the reason why this is, this, the, the frame base is faster than the time base is because my computer is actually pretty fast. So it's able to uh, generate frames faster than the time-based animation is basically set as, as, uh, as far as uh, repainting the screen. So that's basically all, all that is. Now if we take a look at this, we just have a canvas, nothing in it as usual. And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to write this into uh, JavaScript. So on load, getting the canvas and get the context into two-dimensional. Going to create a new image variable. And basically, the event, the image listener we're going to put into load, this function, set interval to draw every 16, 16th of a second, for example. Okay, And we're going to set the source is fish.png. Now, the draw is basically what we're setting here is draw frame-based and draw time-based, which are two uh, methods or functions that I've actually done myself. So the draw frame base is basically we're saying, okay, increment the uh, increment the the distance between the two different uh, fish from before. So I'll basically create the distance, clear the screen in this case, then fill it with the the title, and then draw the image where it is should be on the next frame. Likewise, the draw time base is where it's getting the date and changing the date between the two. And if the date is changed or the date time I should say is changed enough between the two. Redraw the frame, uh, redraw the, uh, the the canvas so that you can actually get that. So that's basically all you have to do, and then you actually fill the text and everything else like that. Pretty pretty simple, and the rest of it is just mathematics around actually getting the uh, the fish to show up a little bit further down the list as before. Okay. All right. So that was timers, and now transforms. So again, this one's pretty simple. It's a canvas, okay? And what we're going to do here, I'll show you in a second, is on load, we're going to get the canvas, and we're going to do a translation for an offset. So basically what we're doing here is we're figuring out, you know, every single time we can, move the image, you know, in a circle around. So basically what we're doing here is we're rotating the context, you know, various different ways. So using the pi 3.14 times 0 0.2 for just a rotation style and then set the fill style for a rectangle and everything else like that. Very, very simple. I'll show you what it looks like. It makes it look like a little bit of a flower. So basically what we're doing is we're taking a rectangle and just rotating it across. So we'll just wait for it to show up. There we go. So it starts basically here, this rectangle right here, and basically we're offsetting it and changing it around. So again, this is just a ca uh, canvas. There's no image or anything else like that. Okay, So it's just uh, the page itself. Okay. All right, now we'll do video. This one's pretty cool. So video is interesting because you can do some interesting things with the video tag as well as the, um, uh, the canvas. So if you take a look at what we have here, just very carefully look at when, when it loads, you'll see right around here there's a gradient. OK, well, there we go. There's the image, and it's sort of reflecting right here. Well, that's kind of cool. So. Here's a video. I can play, play, pause, whatever. This is not a video if I right click here. This is actually a canvas right here that's sort of reflecting the, the frame of the actual video. So let's take a look at what this looks like very quickly. So if you look at the canvas or the, the, the actual HTML, we have a video tag of the source, which is similar to what we had before, just a break tag, and then we have the canvas underneath. What we're going to do is on the load, we're going to get the video and the canvas into uh, variables, and then set the context to two-dimensional, and then set the you know video width and canvas height to these things, to 300 and 200 respectively, and then basically we're going to translate the context and flip it. So basically this is an identity matrix right here, the scale to one minus one. So basically what this is doing is that anything that we put on the actual uh, canvas, we're going to flip it over and, and, and display it that way. 
Then what we did was we created a gradient. If you remember when we loaded the canvas, you'll see, you remember there was a, a black at the top and then it sort of faded to white at the bottom. So that's kind of what we're doing here. So creating a fill style for the gradient and then setting the, uh, the canvas full to that. And then once the video is playing, set the interval. So basically draw the image of the video into the canvas every single time you can. So anytime there's a frame available for me to actually scre uh, scrape from the video, do that and then uh, dis display it on the canvas, which we've already flipped over and created the gradient. So it creates that sort of shimmery uh, reflection uh, type of uh, look and feel. So that's pretty cool right there too. The last thing I'm gonna show you is a game. So I'm not going to show you all the, the, the JavaScript because there's a lot to it. But basically, if you take a look right here, this game, and I'll show you what it looks like in the browser soon, the canvas is empty. So you don't need a lot of you know, markup to actually create a game. It's really all in the JavaScript where the, the, the rubber meets the road. So canvas is where you actually have the game show up. But here, for example, all this JavaScript that you see is basically defining bullets and aliens and what to do when you load the actual game and things like that, and how to deal with behaviors such as mouse moving and things like that. So literally, you can create an amazing, amazing experience by just doing some interesting things. And you can even add audio to it if you want to as well. So for example, this is the canvas right here. So, so you can have audio. As you can see, that was just me sort of you know, singing. This is the worst alien invasion ever because they don't fire back, but you get the idea, right? So the whole idea here is, you know, I'm using my mouse to actually go back and forth, you know, and fire bullets where appropriate. And as you can see, the aliens are going back and forth, and there's some artificial intelligence logic to say how many aliens should go at once, and if I wanted to, I could set it up so that, you know, do they fire back, and how often do they fire back, and when do they fire back, those types of things. Okay? All right. So let's get back to the presentation. SVG, uh, I'm probably going to skip over the demos for this other than just one demo because I think this is, uh, th this is something that's been around for a long time, SVG. So the ability to have graphics that no matter how close you zoom into it, it actually still looks crisp. So it's not pixelated like a bitmap or a PNG would be, for example, if you actually zoom into it. This is really important because we, we're, we're in a situation where you know, uh, browsers nowadays are touch friendly, if not touch first in a lot of ways, right? So the whole idea is to create an experience that you know, as you pinch and zoom, you know, you're able to create this experience that doesn't make it look pixelated where appropriate. So there's lots of things you can do with S SVG. And SVG is sort of a vector graphics format that basically, similar to what XAML was, if you remember from the previous uh, uh, session around defining your UI within markup, SVG is sort of XML that defines images in a lot of ways. So, you know, and because you're defining images and markup as vectors, for example, as you zoom in, it just recognizes the fact that you're zooming in and it doesn't have to have a pixelated thing because it's not a snapshot in time. The vector graphics does, you know, zoom in as appropriate as well. So, for example, I'm just going to show you the one demo for that. image. Yeah, there we go. So here we have image source equals SVG, sample of, uh, of a gra graphics, uh, SVG graphics file. So if you take a look here, OK, well, this is just a robot. But if I actually zoom in to 400%, for example, because I don't have a touch screen on this uh, laptop, you'll see here it's still very crisp. Now, it may not look very crisp, very fuzzy. But if you look closely on the actual um, actual file or actual image, the reason why it doesn't look crisp is because we've added a whole bunch of other lines here to give that sort of fuzziness to it. So even though you know I zoomed into 400%, if this is a uh, PNG, it would look very pixelated. In this case, it's very, very crisp, and it's very easy to see. So another good example would be, very quickly, uh, let's see. Let's look at this one. I think this is the one. Yep. So uh, actually, that's a little bit different. Let me. That wasn't the one I was thinking of. Let's see here. Gradients. 
So you can actually di dynamically sort of identify, you know, things such as uh, graphics. As you can see right here, the gradients and the do something, it's all there. You can create a button that, that does something with gradients inside the button. So it's actually fairly simple to do that uh, using SVG within, um, uh, with, within, with gradients using uh, JavaScript. So um, it's typical button type right here, for example. So an HTML button with the text do something. And if you go right here, you can take a look here. There's just an event listener on load, pushing colors from one one thing to the one offset to the next offset. Create the gradient for through the SVG. So you're actually creating through JavaScript, creating a v, an SVG file on the fly that allows you to do this. If you're trying to do this in JavaScript alone, creating a gradient within within a button be very difficult to do in very very short amount of time or a short number of lines of code. It's actually very difficult to do at all. Uh, so this is an example of how you can do that. All right. So getting back to the presentation, I'm going to show you a few things around CSS3 next. And the reason for that is uh, CSS3, kind of like the HTML5 specifications, there's a lot that's really, really important. Um, CSS3 is the way that you can actually um, manipulate how the look and feel of your application looks like in the browser or on the actual uh, um, on the actual page itself, uh, or, or a web app such as an HTML5 native app in Windows 8, for example. So I'm going to show you a few demos around this just to give you an idea, and then we'll we'll have to get back to the slides because I think we're running out of time. So quickly, I'll show you some CSS right here. Okay, I'm going to show you the media queries. So if you're familiar with something called responsive web design, you're probably already familiar with this. But the bottom line here is. You can use CSS and media queries, which are part of CSS, to I, recognize how big the viewport is of your actual browser. Uh, and that's really important for determining you know, how to render your UI according to whether you're on a phone or whether you're on a PC or even in television for that matter. It's responsive, meaning that you build one website that understands, even though there's various different form factors, you can basically decide how you want to uh, create those. Uh, create those experiences, and they they are responsive to the different screen sizes that are available. So I'm going to show you the, show you this first before we actually go through it. Okay. Oh, hold on. Just let me get the zoom factor a little bit back to normal. So there we have. Okay. Going to make this a little bit smaller as we go forward. So we have a, a you know my hand or somebody's hand, and this Giorgio Sardo's hand actually. So as I get this smaller and smaller, you'll notice. Oh. Made it smaller, so it's four. As I get smaller, three, smaller two, smaller one. So you can see right away that you know, regardless of how I've actually sort of created this website, it's actually being responsive to the fact of how I'm actually, you know, how big my my viewport is, you know, how big the browser is, or how big the device is. So let's take a look at how that works. Good example of this. So we have a div of class type box, and basically all I'm doing is in the CSS itself, I'm saying that. If the minimum width of my viewport is 700 pixels, then I want the background image to be images5.jpg, and the five stands for the five fingers, for example. Well, four fingers and a thumb, if you really want to be very uh, specific. And then define the height and the width. Likewise, using a media query, the at media within the CSS, if it's between 600 and 700 pixels, I want you to show the image that had the four, um, the, the four fingers, for example. And likewise, going further down, 500 pixels and 600 pixels, you go to three digits uh, on, the, on the hand. And then 450 and 500, we go to two. And then finally, defaults, which is basically less than 450 in this case, saying the style of the box is that you actually show the thumbs up, which is the single, uh, the single thumb right there. So very, very simple. And it's, it's easy to actually implement some really interesting media queries. Now, this is about as simple as it gets for media queries, but there's lots that you can do around that. So I'm going to show you one more CSS very quickly. And that's the border, sh border shadows here. So one of the things that we've been able to do is that with CSS, you can actually define opacity or pa opacity, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, borders, borders, shadows, and all those types of things. So the ability to have translucency within your images without actually having a separate image for everything. So if you take a look here, we have, for example, a paragraph with just chow, pure imagination. What up? I'm going to show you what this looks like. 
wait for it to show up here. There we go. So this is text, as you can see right here. It's not an image. And we have some box right here that's basically translucent because I got an image in the background that just shows that it's uh, slightly transparent. And then we have a, a drop shadow here as well. So this is very difficult to do, um, well, almost impossible to do without you know, doing weird things to the images or whatever it is that you might want to do. Using only CSS and very few things around images, in fact, no images, you can see right here, we have a paragraph, we have the color is going to be whatever, font weight, whatever. And then we have a background that's basically saying the red, green, blue, and then the alpha. And the alpha is basically, if you're familiar with image processing, allows you to determine how, uh, you know, what is the, um, uh, the value of a color that would be considered transparent so that you can create a transparency yet have some color associated with it as well. So this is a CSS component right here. Likewise, the div, what we have here, is some new CSS-specific uh, uh, features for CSS as well, for CSS3, I should say, the new, new standards. We have a border radius, so you can set up a border radius which is kind of cool because it allows you to do some interesting things. And then a box shadow. And you can define what color the box shadow is, how big the box shadow is going to be, and all those types of things. So again, no images whatsoever except for just the test image, which was that sort of checkered image to show you that um, uh, you know, it's a transparent. And then you can actually manipulate that using specific things within, uh, within, within that uh, CSS as well. So pretty cool. Now we'll get back to the... To the, uh, to the presentation. So I'm not going to show any demos with this because you know it gets fairly involved and we don't have a whole lot of time. But ECMAScript, also known as JavaScript, you have the ability to add some really interesting things uh, you know, around new array methods. So it makes it easier for you to use manipulate arrays and, and enhance object models to make it more object oriented to help you, uh, you know, deal with things in more object oriented technologies and things. But more so to the fact, and this is one that's very, very important, is JSON. So JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And it's basically a text format, very lightweight, even compared to XML, for example, that allows you to provide serialized data. So you can serialize an object in code into a text file using JSON, which is basically you know, a key va value pair within text uh, that you can actually parse within your, uh, your JavaScript to make use of and then bring that into um, into objects within JavaScript very simply. So we actually support that natively within, uh, within JavaScript now. So you don't have to have all these uh, methods that require required or functions that are required to actually deserialize that, that, that uh, JSON and everything else like that. So that's available for you. Frameworks and tools. Uh, so one of the interesting things here. So Visual Studio 2012 is a, a monumental leap uh, for how we deal with uh, web technologies on the Microsoft, well, not on the Microsoft platform, but how you can develop using Microsoft technologies. So one of the things, for example, is we've added something called the Visual Studio Web Essentials. And I'll show you the web page for that in just a second. But believe it or not, you know, like web, web developers in general never think of Visual Studio as an IDE for building HTML5 experiences or HTML experiences altogether because it was very difficult to provide the right amount of uh, capability that allows you to build these great experiences. Well, there's the Visual Studio 2012.2 web extensions or web essentials are called actually adds that into Visual Studio. So if you're a web developer and you're not and you do have Visual Studio 2012, you can download the web essentials for free and you'll be very pleasantly surprised as to what it provides to you. Um, down the road, we'll provide you with a, uh, a great uh, uh, webinar, for example, if you want to, around how you can make use of this. But just to show you exactly what this is, so if you go to vswebessentials.com, it gives you all sorts of things that you can actually make use of within Visual Studio to create it into a first class, you know, best of breed type of integrated development environment for you to actually build great, uh, great HTML5 experiences using Visual Studio, which is just beyond a lot of people. And like I said, it's completely free that you can make use of. And it's, uh, as you can see, there's all sorts of great, uh, great examples of people that love it and things like that. Some of these are Microsoft or ex-Microsoft folks, so 
keep that with a grain of salt. But frankly, I've seen this in action. It's an amazing, amazing set of tools that if you're building web, uh, web experiences today, you do need to get this if you're using Visual Studio because you'd be very pleasantly surprised as to how productive it makes you. So um, without further ado, there's other things such as Modernizer. I won't get too much into this, but basically this is a querying tool that allows you to query whether or not a browser supports certain functionality in modern browsers. So say, for example, you know, using the box shadow CSS technique, you can actually add a modernizer query that says, does this browser support box shadow? And it'll bring back true or false. And if it brings back a false, then you can actually add additional code that allows you to handle the in a graceful way you know, how the, the objects will be rendered on the screen on older browsers, such as IE6, for example. Okay. And then there's other things such as polyfills for uh, uh, for adding to you know that great experience for backwards compatibility to older browsers because certainly you know as you can imagine a lot of enterprises are not using modern browsers today but certainly do require that capability. So that's basically it. And uh, if remember at the very beginning uh, of the session we had you know this question what exactly is HTML5 and I sort of explained what I thought it was. Uh, hopefully you agree with me to an extent as to what it is. But this is kind of where we are. Um, as I said, Windows or HTML5, sorry, is not a ratified standard at this point. So the things in green are basically a recommendation. So obviously, uh, as you can see, ECMAScript, uh, the latest version of it, is is a ratified standard. The rest of them largely are not quite ready yet. Now this is granted a little bit old. Uh, there's there has been some movement compared to uh, what this graph looks like right now. But it's still, we have a long way to go. So even though you might be building an HTML5, uh, fully HTML5 compliant website today, you might have some discrepancies between the various different browsers because they implement and interpret the various different uh, standards in different ways uh, because the fact that none of, some of the standards have not yet been ratified. We expect that to happen in 2014, but uh, it does take time, unfortunately. So there is a little bit of movement right now, uh, but do the right things uh, and try to make your applications on the web and uh, native applications that use HTML5 as standardized as possible. Uh, and then hopefully the rendering will be basically just fine once the browsers figure out exactly what those standards are and once they've been ratified. So I already talked about beauty of the web, so I won't go to, to that. But there's a whole bunch of resources as well. Uh, these will be available to you after the event. Um, and uh, if you want, you can get this presentation on wootstudio.ca, which is our app uh, blog. Likewise, um, take a look at uh, developer movement, which is basically the branding for this uh, virtual event. Um, you can build some amazing, amazing experiences for HTML5 on Windows 8 in native format, as well as on Windows Phone in hybrid format, which we'll talk about in the next session. Uh, that could be very, very interesting to you. So without uh, further ado, I'll let you get to the next break, and uh, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks.